Social media and media that's social. This week we look at media experiments old and new, both creating community and empowering activism. One, a philanthropically funded radio station in the gentrifying town of Kingston, New York. The other, a popular podcast and social media feed from civil rights activist DeRay McKesson. He's also out with a new book. What difference do media make? That's coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. So there's the concept of the commons. This radio station and its frequency belong to the people of Kingston. And so bringing it back to the people of Kingston, giving the people of Kingston who didn't have a chance to have access maybe to being on the air here before is why we're doing what we're doing. And the end result is hopefully a city that falls in love with itself. My name is Jimmy Buff. I'm the executive director of Radio Kingston. I also host the afternoon program. It's called Jimmy Buff Loves You. So I have a great little jingle that says, Jimmy, Jimmy Buff loves you. And it's a reminder to myself to, uh, to act that way. That's yes at Radio Kingston and Starship Trooper. We are all made of stars. So we took over on November 1st, 2017. And by January 1st, 2018, we had gone from a commercial radio station to a non-commercial radio station. We had um, jettisoned two-thirds of the syndicated programming, which is programming that doesn't come from here, doesn't employ local people, um, and has no real value to the community, and started replacing it with local programming. And since then, we've added, my guess is about 30 different radio shows representing many, many different voices of the community. You're listening to La Voz. Estás escuchando La Voz. Sí, esto es La Voz en Radio Kingston. Soy Mariel Fiori. Estamos hasta las 12 del mediodía, de lunes a viernes de 10 a 12. Nos pueden escuchar. Y hoy es Día de Política, así que la tenemos a Ashley Ditus y también a Gladys Figueroa. Y estamos hablando de que este jueves son las elecciones primarias. Una de las cosas importantes aquí en la estación es que no tenemos que buscar ratings. Y así podemos invitar a cualquier persona que has something to offer to our community. And people from all walks of life, we can have here somebody who works a, as a dishwasher and we can also have somebody who teaches at Bar College or New Paul, SUNY New Paul's or any university. It's uh, something that Marilyn and I share because we think that everybody has a story to tell. Uh, we came on to the La Vaz radio station. It's a Spanish language um, informational segment that they do here in Kingston Community or Radio. Uh, I don't want people to forget that there's an election. I want them to vote. I want them to exert their democratic uh, rights. Um, I think it's very important uh, to use all avenues of media to get that information out there to the public. A lot of our things that we have in print, that's all in English, so those voters are not understanding that maybe they don't read English, maybe they speak it limitedly. So to have an actual Spanish-speaking program locally and be locally based, that's amazing to me. And we didn't have that last year. It's a new program, so I'm really excited to have a partnership where I can reach another section of my community that might not know otherwise what is happening um, for our elections. In the past and in other stations around the area, they, they say they are local, but there's just a playlist and then maybe there's one host or one DJ per day and that's it. We are here all, every morning and every day there's a different host. So uh, we are really talking about what is happening locally. And last week or two weeks ago, we had all our guests plan out. We have uh, professors that they coming from local schools talking about literature and whatnot, and all of a sudden a local pastor came in and said, hey, I have an announcement, can I make it? If this was a playlist of songs, someone would knock on the door, no one would answer. But we don't have a playlist, we are here. So people come in and they, they make their announcements, and you know, this is how a community radio station works. It's a radio show in Spanish. It doesn't mean that only Spanish speakers are listening to us. There's a lot of gringos, and that's in the good sense of the word, that are practicing their Spanish by listening to our radio show and at the same time getting informed, entertained because we have some music, good music too. 
we're funded entirely by the Novo Foundation and um, they have made available to us resources beyond what a small city radio station usually have access to because the mission is what it is. And so we're able to function without compromising our programming for a fun drive. We're not worried about if an advertiser gets upset with something that they hear on the radio and they decide they want to pull their advertising and we have to respond to market concerns that way. We get to be um, as pure when it comes to broadcasting as we possibly can. Hi, I'm Freedom Walker. And I'm Beetle. And we are the Black Meta. No, no, uh, that was sarcasm. This is not a post-racial society. Anyone who says <laughs> that is probably a giant racist or a complete idiot. I'm sorry if you're listening and you think that, but yeah, you're either a racist or an idiot. We launch actually March. I've never done radio. March 6. When um, Radio Kingston came up, when I went to their open house, and I, um, they were looking for ideas. So I came in there, I said, okay, I have an idea. Uh, but I'm seeing this gentrification happening, and I want to help in some way. Maybe I could reach out to the organizations that are here that are trying to help people in their human resources, get together, talk about this, and come up with solutions and ideas. And the executive director, Jimmy Buff, said, hey, why don't you do a show? And then Julie Novak um, suggested that I would get someone to team up with me. So uh, we went to a TMI performance, Beetle and I, and then we said hi to each other. We were just talking, and Julie was staring at us, and I, I knew something was going on with her. So she suggested that, hey, I found your partner. Why don't you two team up on the show? We wanted entertainment. We wanted to express our views. We wanted to get out of the box, and that stereotype. We wanted to talk about things that the world thinks black people have no stake in, no opinion about. We think about existentialism, we think about the world that we live in and the particulars of that world. We find random things interesting. And like I said, we're not one note songs. I want to see the black meta develop more into like an information radio that people are tuning in and we're giving information and actually helping. But we also have to keep developing um, our relationships with the community. I've said it before, radio is like 98% awful, just badly done. So if you do something good in radio, it looks or it sounds amazing. You got to take the enemy's tools and use them and use them better. And I think we can. I mean, I'm pretty sure I can out rant Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> it's kind of like taking back this country. If I can do it by taking a radio station or taking a medium, I'm going to do that. And I'm not going to stop there. So, you know, the people who were here before we took over are still here. When we first met Warren and we came into the radio station, it was a little like meeting the captain of a ghost ship. He was the only person here um, and doing an, a remarkable job at maintaining the radio station basically on little or no resources. It was just extraordinary. So what were you doing a year ago? What was, what was your life like before the station came into its current iteration? It was very quiet here. It was me. I didn't know where we were going. We were owned by corporate America, and it was really getting tough to survive. We were still making some money, which you had to do in commercial radio, but it was getting tougher and tougher. And uh, they, left, they left me here as the only person in charge. Radio Kingston approached them and wanted to buy the radio station, and they agreed for a certain amount of money. And the vision that Radio Kingston brings with it? The vision is community radio, serving the community and uh, many, many voices in the community. There's something for everyone to tune into and enjoy and learn from. So what's happening at Radio Kingston isn't taking place in a vacuum. It's part of a city-wide revitalization plan, at the heart of which is a comprehensive vision for the future that was articulated by the city back in 2015. To find out a little bit more and about the role of the mayor, we headed to City Hall to speak to Mayor Stephen Noble. All of these mayors have come from all different backgrounds, and, and many of them are... Well, not that many different backgrounds. No, they're mostly all white men. <laughs> they're all white men, I can assure you that. So, a few years ago, you came up with, or the city came up with, a vision plan. Talk about that process, and what was, or what, what was that document about? We wanted to have a 10-year vision to be able to make sure that each of our neighborhoods um, would have attention, uh, that we would focus um, on our assets, and really be able to build a community from the ground up. As you drove down um, from the radio station, you'll see we had an uptown, 
a midtown and a downtown. And I think one part of our, our comprehensive plan is to figure out how to stitch together our community back together again so that we are a community of one and one that really looks out for one another and can, if one neighborhood is doing well, the other parts of the city would also prosper. And what role does the radio station play? In so one of the things that I've really tried to do uh, is to be able to get more residents connected to, to the city. And I think having a community radio station is vital to do that because unfortunately with all of the media conglomerates across the world buying up every little bitty radio station, uh, you basically can hear the same thing on a hundred different stations at any point in our country. And for us, we were going to lose one of our only locally owned uh, radio stations. And at the perfect opportunity, you know, Radio Kingston came to be. And for us, it's connecting a whole new voice to Kingston. Uh, folks who have never had a voice before now have an outlet to be able to talk about their issues, talk about their concerns, and to be able to have equal airtime um, you know, as everyone else in the city. And so as the mayor, I have Mondays with the mayor. And so I have a 30 minute block um, where I'm able to go ahead and talk about issues that are important to me. Um, but there's also every other organization and every group in the city that wants to say something has just as much time or more time than I do. And so that's something that is unique about community radio. And I think it's something that, you know, a small community like Kingston is really lucky to have. You have the unusual um, good fortune as mayor of having some fairly uh, well endowed people living in your neighborhood, meaning enormous philanthropists with the Novo Foundation and Jennifer and Peter Buffett. How do you think about that? And how should we think about what's happening in Kingston? Um, would it be possible without some large donors? So one of the things that I think has made Kingston unique is that you know we never really had the large foundations. We don't have the corporate entities. There was really not a lot of planned giving uh, in our community. And so Kingston has always had to, over the 400 year history, really be able to um, make its own way. And for us, I think you know using that funding to be able to create uh, an environment where the citizenry is engaged and the public can recognize that we kind of teach you a new way and then you'll continue to do that even if the, you know, the Buffets aren't here tomorrow. They're not necessarily you know, building billion dollar buildings here in Kingston, but I think that they're, they're putting their, their efforts into uh, entities and organizations that care about people. And I think that there will be a lot of dividends. Um, you know, and I think that that could happen in any community. First off, why invest in a radio station? You two are not media funders, generally right. speaking. You right. don't have a chain of radio stations with nope. the word Buffett on them. <laughs> right. so, so why here in Kingston, Radio Kingston? Well, it really starts from the fact that we live here and we started to recognize what a, a special and, and typical, both, community this was. It's a town of 25,000 people. Uh, it has percentages of pretty much everything that any town USA has. And so as I started to think about our philanthropic work that we do here and there and everywhere else, I thought that by being here, I could learn more specifically about what it means to uh, move into a future that we're all hoping we can create together. And I wanted people in this community to be able to open their door and recognize that they belong to something and hurt each other, knew each other, wanted to nurture each other together, take care of each other, whatever that is. And you can only do that if you're listening. I look at this station, and I know Jimmy does as well, as a, it's a uh, social good organization. It's, a, it's not a radio station, it's something else. The station isn't just about what goes over the airwaves, it's about the block parties, it's about being at City Hall and letting people know what's going on. It's, it's about these other ways it, it can put its tentacles into the community and, and be an amplifier of what's really already happening. So it's not, I'm buying a station somewhere so that it can survive and play things that are liberal. You know, it's no, we're in here to help sustain, build and grow a nurturing, loving place we have an ecosystemic problem. <laughs> this is not, oh, if we could just fix this, everything would be great. No, this is complex, and so we do. We look at food and health and education and energy and agriculture and all these different things that all make up this tapestry and the station, it's critical to the health of this place. 
being funded the way we are, we have the um, sense of what life can be post-capitalism. People don't realize this, but in the first two Star Trek series with Captain Kirk and Captain Picard, both of them make statements about how somewhere in the 21st century, mankind decided that money wasn't necessary and that we worked for the good of each other. And maybe that happens somehow, you know? This is a, a little taste of that. We come in here and it's not about um, our salaries as much as the mission. I'm Jimmy Buff and Frank Oranger is coming along at the top of the hour to keep us free. Hope, are you for it? Or against it, the word has a bad rap, wishy-washy, dream don't do. When it was a slogan of the Obama administration, it felt like a bit of a confidence trick, hoping let a lot of activists to sort of de-escalate their work for change. But our guest says hope is also a means of survival and strategy while thinking creatively about how to take power. I'm joined by activist and author D. Ray McKesson, who makes the case for hope and imagination's role in his new book, On the Other Side of freedom. McKesson's an activist from Baltimore, Maryland, whose work during the Ferguson uprising gave him, a, gave him a national profile, also spurred him to run for mayor, a bid he lost and for which he received a certain amount of grief. He is now the executive producer of Pod Save the People, one of my favorites. It's a podcast exploring social issues through commentary and conversation. Welcome to the show, D-Ray. Glad it's to have you. good to be here. So, 2014, Ferguson... What's happened? What's changed since? What's changed with you? What's changed with the movement, media? Yeah, think about you think about 2014 is that people thought there was a problem in Ferguson. They didn't think there was a problem in America. And now people realize that this issue of police violence and criminal justice has to be a nationwide conversation. Yeah. You know, when we were in the street, if you ever saw us marching, we were in the street for 400 days, you know? You forget that. Yeah, people, people think about it as like a long weekend. It was like a long 400 days. And, you know, it was illegal to stand still in August, September, and October of 2014. So if you ever saw us marching, it wasn't that we thought marching was cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was that we had to. You know, we didn't get it declared unconstitutional until October, which is sort of wild. So I think that what has changed is that the, co the, the awareness is different, that now there's a nationwide conversation. The press is pushing back on the police in ways that they weren't before, and we know way more about policing than we did then. And media's changed. I mean, at that time, we were finding out what was happening from your Twitter feed and other yeah, people's. Yeah, And even the reporters, you know, there'd be press conferences with the police, and the, and the reporters would ask these softball questions. There'd be inconsistencies in the police narrative, and the reporters would be like, oh, well, the police said it. And now, like, you just see aggressive reporting in a way that is really powerful because we don't have to be the only people sort of picking it apart now. Now, how have you changed? I mean, I was struck by the subtitle of your book. Well, the subtitle of the book, The, the Case for Hope, is trying to be really clear that, you know, when we say the system is broken and people say, oh, no, it was designed to be like this, my takeaway from that is that it was designed, mm -hmm. right? People made this up. And because people made it up, we can make something different. So when I think about hope, hope is a belief that our tomorrows can be better than our today's. When King says the, the more arc bends towards justice, that's a statement about faith, belief in things unseen. Uh, when we think about hope, hope says the arc can bend because people bend it. Yeah, you don't and just like, sit around and wait for it to bend. At least yeah, that's my approach. Yeah, and like hope is hope is work. Hope's not magic, right? So when I think about like why are all these people in the street, why are people running for office, why are people at board meetings and all this other stuff, it's because they know that this version of the world that we're in right now is not the best version that it can be. All right, so that's the case for hope. Imagination has the, is the part about the other side of justice imagining some, something we haven't actually seen? Yeah, so you can't fight for what you can't imagine, right? That part of this is understanding that freedom is not only the absence of oppression, but the presence of justice and joy. So we can get rid of all the bad things, but getting rid of all the bad things doesn't mean that the good things suddenly come in. We gotta make the good things. So we can free everybody from prison. That isn't the presence of justice in and of itself. We have to build a justice system that is like real and true and honest and doesn't damage people. So the imagination part is really, is really key. And let's talk a bit about the work, because I was very struck, on both on, on Pod Saves the People and in some of the interviews in Pod Saves the People, so both in your commentaries and in the interviews, you often talk about the importance of addressing structural challenges that are not so very sexy, um, and maybe we don't talk about enough. And not so long ago, I, th I give you credit for her victory in the primary. You interviewed uh, Letitia James, uh, the public advocate of yeah. New York, who, who just won the primary to, to run for attorney general. Let's talk about the work that isn't sexy, because she talked about it. She said, you know, you asked like, what does the public advocate does? Well, they do this, that, this, that, and that that you've never heard of. What does the attorney general do? Kind of the same, except for a few yeah. high profile things. Um, our media doesn't help, I don't think. 
in talking about what it takes to actually make change. No, I agree. So we think I spend more time around the police than, than anything else. And like you think about in California, there's a law in California that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline right. regardless of the outcome. Right. That's wild, right? That is a huge lever to change. But it just isn't really sexy. Or like in Cleveland, they destroy police officer disciplinary records every two years. That is wild. But like it's not necessarily a sexy. That is probably sexier than some other policy stuff. But like still, it doesn't ever break through. So I'm shocked too. What we found is that a lot of reporters are still nervous about attacking some of the system stuff. They're nervous about writing about police unions. They're nervous about writing some of these things that seem really wonky, but they have a huge impact on people's lives. And what she said was, I could take on this question of the police secrecy laws yeah. and the secrecy around the records of individual police Which is great. officers. That could make a real change. It could be huge, yeah, and like they could be a leader here. You know, in that episode, we also talked about some legislation that other places have put into into place to make sure that there are independent investigations, to make sure that uh, municipalities don't get to create rules that like do all these weird and wacky things. So I'm hopeful about her. Uh, you know, and what was interesting about the conversation with Tish James is that she's like publicly walking into the issues with the police. Most people are like. And very quietly being like, okay, we support you on the police. Right. But she's sort of like, this is an issue. And it's like, thank you, this is an issue. And a third of all the people killed in this country by a stranger is actually killed by a police officer. That is wild. You talked about the statistics in, in California in the book. I mean, the, the chapter on policing in the book is deep. Yeah, one in 11 gun homicides in California is committed by an officer. So how do we build movement? I mean, one of the criticisms that you got when you ran for mayor was he hasn't done the street work. He doesn't have the credibility. He hasn't got, he's got the followers, but he doesn't have the followers in the street or the, the track record. Um, how do we build movement that also generates leaders uh, without kind of cannibalizing our leaders, which is something we often do as soon as they get the head over the parapet. Yeah, I think about, you know, when I ran for mayor in Baltimore, it's this interesting thing because it wasn't necessarily not having the street credit. It was a lot of people saying, you didn't do it with me, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd open up an after-school center in Baltimore. I trained and supported a third of all the new teachers in the city, worked in the Office of Human Capital. So I'd done work, more work than a lot of people, but they were like, well, I didn't see you. It's like, well, you were in middle school when I opened up the after-school center. That's why I didn't see you. Mm. But there is this question, what is true is that when I ran for mayor, there was this idea that being a part of the system was selling out. That like, if you choose to be a part of it, then like you actually aren't really fighting. It's just about you. In the advent of Trump, you see the exact opposite now. It's like, if you don't run for office, you don't care, right? Everybody's running for office. You probably donated 10 million campaigns. I've donated 10 million campaigns. I've supported all these people. That like, there's a sea change that has happened all of a sudden because people realize we can't just be yelling at the people in power. We have to be the people in power. And we have to keep at it. I mean, is that why you wear the vest? To, to remember that this is a long-term project? Yeah, and I, you know, I've been wearing this specific vest since the protests, and uh, I never want to forget what happened, right? That was just not too long ago. I never want to forget what it was like to be dragged out of a police department by my ankles. I never want to forget what it was like to be tear gas and pepper spray because that was real. And it reminds me that freedom is fragile. And like, I never want to get, no matter what room I'm in, I never want to be deluded to think, oh no, we got this. This is like, because reality is for all of the awareness that has happened over the last four years, the outcomes are still bad, right? The police are still killing as many people as they used to kill despite the despite all of the media awareness. So people do lose hope. I mean, they, they lose that, exactly that quality of belief that something could really be different. And then they give up voting or they give up getting active. I think that people's faith is being challenged. I think that the certainty or the, the sense that it is coming I think is what's challenge. I think that people's hope is actually why you still see people running for office. It's why you still see people going out into the street. It's why you see people at the conferences. Like, it, like that is hope to me. That's the work of hope. That's mm -hmm. all hope work happening. Mm -hmm. But it's very different from faith. Yeah, faith is, again, if King, when King says the arc bends, he's like, it just bends towards justice. Mm -hmm. I think that people are challenging that at this moment. They're like, we don't know if it just bends. I think that what we're saying is that it bends because people bend it. And I think that people understand that now. So when you say we nowadays, who does that we refer to? The we is a lot of people. <laughs> but I often, you know, I'm always reminded that I'm one of many people who stood in the street. So when I talk about the we in, in that sense, it's, you know, everybody, I think, fighting for justice. When I say we created these projects around police union contracts or uh, use of force policies, it's me, Brittany Packnett, and Samuel Sinyangwe, who I've been with for a long time. We've kept the team pretty small because we want to be as nimble as possible in the work. You're learning a lot doing that podcast. Are you enjoying it? I, so what I love about the podcast is that I'm learning too, right? That it's not me just like saying all these random things. It's, it's me, Brittany uh, Packnett, um, Samuel Sinyangwe, and Clint Smith III, who like everybody brings their own perspective. And like, you know, we just recorded the other day and 
everybody's news. I was like, that was great. Didn't know that. That was great. This is amazing. So I appreciate that. Some people are saying, oh, this is the new, you know, alternative to the right wing media network. Is it as simple as that? Yeah. You know, what we find is that people are hungry for good content. Right. And I was the third podcast on the network. I've been around since since uh, Crooked started. Uh, and you you know, last year we were one of the most download, top 20 downloaded in the country, won two Webbies for best news and people's choice for best news. So proud of the podcast. People listen to it. And, you know, with Podsy of America, they follow the day to day news sort of that's happening with Trump. And we follow all the news you don't know, but should. Right. Um, and then there are a host of other podcasts that have spawned in the network, too, trying to cover all of the different pockets of people in the country who want to be informed. You know, I spend more time on Twitter than anywhere else. And what I've realized is that, like, it's just not a great platform for telling full stories. I can tell bite-sized things, I can tell quick messages, but like how to tell a full story, you just can't do it there. So in the book, it's the first time I write about my mother leaving and what that meant. Uh, I write about being gay for the first time in the book. I've been out for as long as I can remember, but I write about it for the first time. So those are important to me because we show up as our full selves in all the rooms that we're in. And we think about like what it means to be intersectional. Intersectionality is not about intersecting identities. It's about intersecting systems of oppression. And those intersections show up in every room and everything I do. And to not write about them would have been dishonest. Did you change in your storytelling around your mom or your identity as you were doing the book? Not change. I think I had to search for words, right? So when I think about my mother, um, you know, I know that her absence has made me always think about what it means to be worthy, right? And I know that to be true. I had to write that, though, right? I had to sort of explain what that meant. And, and when I talk about it, I can just say one sentence and hope you fill in the rest. In the book, I have to do more than that. So, so that was hard. You can find the book at your local independent bookseller and find out more information at our website. That's lauraflanders.org or com, either one. Thanks for watching.